Welcome, everyone. My name is Weasel. This is Simple Nomad. We're uh, probably the two oldest members. Obviously, he would be, but uh, the oldest members of the uh, uh, Nomad Mobile Research Center. Uh, we've been doing quite a bit of research for quite a few years and never finishing much of it. So uh, here's a few things that we've actually gotten a chance to get through and get to the end with, and uh, we'll, we'll go through that. All right. Um, basically, I guess what we were trying to do here with a, with a plausible deniability toolkit was uh, come up with something uh, that basically goes beyond anti-forensics. The big problem with anti-forensics uh, from a, someone who may be doing something that may get them in trouble at a later date or doing something that, for whatever reason, uh, anti-forensics has a serious problem with removing possible alibis. And uh, basically, if you can't uh, prove that you were somewhere else, therefore it's just as feasible that you were doing what you're accused of as opposed to what you may or may not have been doing instead. So uh, we wanted to go through and kind of identify basically a methodology, not maybe not that formal, but a methodology for, to help people uh, come up with uh, a good game plan for uh, doing the things that we like to do without possibly looking like we're doing them. Um, yeah, yeah, and the, the whole point of this is to uh, uh, basically get you thinking, all right? Basically start you in a thought process that makes you aware of what it is that when you're, you're using the computer, when you're doing what it is, what you do. Uh, in a lot of cases, a lot of us as researchers, we do things uh, that uh, maybe on the surface even just look suspicious even though we're well within our legal rights to be doing so. And then when you start talking about uh, perhaps you're traveling internationally or something like that, uh, going into extremely hostile environments, uh, then you've got a completely different scenario there. So we wanted something kind of broad and general, uh, to, and we're, we're going to del delve down into, an, I think, enough detail that's actually going to hold your interest. And uh, this, a lot of these methods are very useful for people trying to expand their skill set while they're in, at work. So that's what we'll... Uh Definitely hope to find some room here. Okay, clarifications. Uh, this is not a, a rolled toolkit in the classic sense. Uh, really, I guess the, what we were looking at is verbiage that actually fit for what we were doing, but it's not really a, uh, a downloadable set of tools. Uh, obviously, the big problem there is that you create a fingerprint when something's downloadable and pre-rolled and uh, you know, does specific functions or has a specific function. Uh, we, what we wanted to do was move towards something that would uh, have legitimate uses, something that uh, is dynamic, and uh, something, uh, just methods that, that work uh, without actually saying this person's trying to hide what they're doing. So Yeah, if, you uh, had, if we had a tarball of uh, the uh, plausible deniability toolkit, you know, dot, dot, you know, dot TGZ, and then you you download that and someone finds that in a forensic investigation on your laptop, any type of alibi, legitimate or not, would probably go away at and, that point. And we do understand the entertainment value of creating such a toolkit and seeing all the idiots get popped for it, but <laughs> uh, we thought we would try and watch people's back this time around because, yeah, I, oh, I can't imagine just how fun that would be just to see how many people get fired because WebSense updated their uh, hacking category to include the URL to a, any kind of plausible deniability toolkit. So it's like how to murder my wife Google searches. It, it doesn't work. You don't do it. It's not right. Um, <laughs> murdering your wife, okay, don't search on how to do it. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, EFF has a booth. Uh, <laughs> I recommend finding it. Uh, and they're, they're right there. They're oh, right there. well, there you go. EFF's right here. They're uh, in the room. Uh-oh. Wife. We'll use that term. It's just, you know, significant other. Someone who drives you fucking crazy. Just whatever. <laughs> it doesn't have to be female. It doesn't... Whatever. All right. So... Um, as I've already gone over, is PDTK is not anti-forensics, although it does use many of the, it, you know, it can feasibly use many of the methods used in anti-forensics. Um, but don't get the two confused. Don't think that the two are the same. Um, let's see. 
think we covered everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I kind of covered the point that you know, you, when you just take a anti forensic uh, uh, met, uh, mentality when you're doing the things that we do. Um, as I said, you really cover up alibis. You really cover up a lot of very important information that you might want to leave behind um, that you would like to be there. So, okay. By the way, our goal is to get heckled by the EFF on almost every slide. So, just so you know. Let me get my tape sheet going here. <laughs> All right. Uh, the objectives, provide methods to, use, uh, to the users to reduce threat of incrimination, obviously. Uh, we'll go pretty quick through the first few slides or just to make sure that we get the points out that we want to get in the beginning. Uh, bring forward technologies for legitimate uses such as uh, protecting uh, activists and whistleblowers that uh, have most likely been used in, a underworld, in the underworld for years. Yeah, but most of the, uh, the uh, t technologies and stuff that you would use in, in plausible deniability are not new technologies. You're not going out looking for new tools. Uh, you want to use old tools. You want to use established tools. You want to use uh, legitimate tools. Uh, why would you go through and say, you know, download a I didn't do it dot bin and it's, you know, there, it's obvious you did something wrong. You're doing something wrong or shouldn't be doing what you're doing. So, um, let's see. Yeah, specifically that. Uh, did you, no, let's go ahead. Let's, okay, let's keep let's moving. Forward, yeah. Okay. Um, here's some uh, concepts for uh, for PDTK as uh, data generation, specifically like logs, uh, deleted files, uh, fun stuff like that, where you basically uh, go through and create files that uh, give the appearance that something happened, as opposed to what actually may have happened. Uh, and this is kind of a tricky. Uh, this is kind of a tricky. Uh, you know, a uh, tight wire to, to walk because uh, if you're going to actually go to the trouble to construct actual evidence that you think is going to exonerate you, in theory, it's got to be above your current skill set. Absolutely. Absolutely. You don't want to claim the hacker defense uh, if you're a hacker simply because, you know. Yeah, we'll, and we'll get into that a little bit yeah, later. Yeah, we'll, we'll go into more details there. Uh, data tampering, you know, uh, altering data to get it to. Twist and twist the bits a little bit and make the data more in your favor instead of against your favor. Uh, that can be seen anything from you know editing W temps, the stuff that we've been doing for years, uh, all the anti forensic stuff and so forth, uh, all the way to uh, tampering data on other people's machines and uh, maybe pointing an investigation in a different direction than yourself. Uh, I, I, yeah, I want to make a couple of points on this. When we're talking about pointing things in different directions and whatnot. Uh, just to kind of really start to bring this, uh, bring this home, uh, what we're talking about here is uh, what we refer to as lost keys syndrome. And that is if you've lost your keys and then you find them in the living room, then you're usually, you usually stop looking for your keys at that point. You don't it's go... always in the last place. Yeah, you, you, you don't start going, you know, I think I'm going to check the kitchen just to make sure that, you know, because you've already got them. And what happens in a lot of cases uh, during uh, uh, a forensics investigation is that once they find what looks like the evidence that they are wanting to find. Which you didn't do. Then that's <laughs> what you didn't do. Then that's where the investigation will probably stop at that point. Because they've got like huge caseloads and uh, there's, there's always tons and tons of work for them to get through, and they're going to go through these things in a, in a big hurry. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, go through a little bit more specifics of, uh, of, of the tools we wanted to bring out here. Uh, forensics tools and uh, books alone are bad. This is like if you've got, uh, if the only thing that you've got at your house, if you're doing bad stuff, you know, like, uh, is a whole bunch of tools and, and, and books on anti-forensics, and someone comes and kicks in your door, then it's going to be, oh, well, look at that. That's the kind of stuff that will be taken in, taken in as evidence. Now, what's sad about this is, is if you're doing stuff that's actually legitimate work, okay, uh, this could still possibly be used as a, uh, uh, what's, I, I guess, referred to as uh, indirect or circumstantial evidence as opposed to... You know, I mean, the book didn't commit the crime, you know, but nonetheless, the book is suggesting that you, just because you're in this particular mindset. And so, I mean, uh, another another one specifically is talking about the books. Also, like, uh, uh, it's 
it seems to me that it would be pretty much normal, and this is probably the case for everyone here, that uh, we collect a lot of security books and whatnot. So we're going to have, you know, a pretty big library, and it would not be beyond uh, the stretch of, you know, the imagination that you're going to actually have some forensics books, maybe some anti-forensics books. You will have stuff in there. Uh, as far as your collections of tools, I mean, if you're focused specifically on forensics and anti-forensics and that's all you have, that could potentially look bad. Now, having something like, and I've seen this a lot here, uh, is uh, Backtrack, which is uh, fairly popular, and it has some forensics tools on there. Being in the possession of that Backtrack uh, 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 CD that, or the distro and have it, you know, put it on your hard, you put it on your hard drive or whatever, that's not too unusual particularly if you're doing research, if you're a pen tester, that type of thing, this is something that would be considered a part of your, your arsenal uh, for you to actually do your legitimate job. Yeah, and if you've got forensics and anti-forensics books in your library, don't highlight methods that you'll be using. Uh, I mean, it's just a gimme. These are your slides. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are a lot of tools that already exist on, on the uh, systems that you can use. Uh, you know, there's various things like I mentioned, like hex editors, uh, DD. I, there's a lot of different tools that if you start looking and playing with and seeing, okay, well, I know this is how this particular tool works. I know this is how these types of uh, forensics tools work. And really learn how these things actually happen. You get kind of a real feel for what you can do. Now, the whole idea here is that, you know, you've got control of your system. You have physical control of your computer, correct? So you should be able to, at that level, at a very low level, be able to make changes on their very, very low level type stuff. Now, if you're able to do that and you understand how the uh, forensics tools work, you can conceivably control the flow of the forensics investigation. Okay? You see, that's roughly the point we're getting at here. You're, you're controlling the flow of, of the investigation. Absolutely. Um, yeah, well, let's let me yeah, back up back one, up one slide. Yeah, I, I mentioned here like uh, FISC, okay, uh, on here, and this basically what FISC normally does on most systems is it's looking for, to make sure that the inode stuff are all, they won't have orphans, and it's basically looking for a parent. And a common old school thing was to you, you're going to take in, you're going to create basically loops between inodes, and when it's time to get to that data you've hidden, then you reconnect things, and then now you can get to it, and then maybe you undo it and, and hide it again. Uh, this can work both ways. Maybe you, that's something that uh, you may want to leave in place, and there's something in there that's like you know evidence of a, of a rootkit is is hidden in something like that, where all of a sudden where and you leave it there where a forensics investigation may or may not uncover it. And we'll get into that a little bit deeper where the, you know, the defense uh, forensics investigator may find something and you may want him to find it as opposed to the uh, uh, prosecutor or whatever. But I mean, we're, but you want it to be found, that kind of thing. Keep that in mind when we're talking about these types of techniques where you're squirreling away various uh, bits and bytes uh, uh, on your systems. Right, and, and, and if you're, you're trying to guide that investigation and whatnot, the last, you want to have the mentality that you want it to be found, but don't hide it so well that it can't be found, and don't make it so obvious that it's obvious what happened. Uh, the last thing you want to be doing is directing any kind of investigators verbally or any other manner after the fact of how to find, uh, find this data, right? Uh, don't don't go through and try to direct the uh, the defense team on. Well, if you look in this location, you might find that maybe I was compromised. It's just it's not going to work. That kind of gives it up, right? Which you know that basically pretty much you're you're done. Um, another interesting one. Uh, I don't know how many people here saw Matt Conover's. He did a presentation called uh, "Profiling uh, Rootkits and Malware Through Executive Objects." This was a Windows thing. This is a really, really interesting, uh, uh, it was basically a, 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 a method for modeling um, actions and stuff going on on a Windows system. Uh, the purpose of it was by modeling what's going on, you can actually detect rootkits. The thing is, is that this could obviously be extended uh, to actually be the rootkit itself. You know, kind of like the, the it's like a rootkit, a little bit different layer uh, that you go in there with. Uh, 
this is the kind of thing where you know I would encourage if you you know if you're really wanting to squirrel away something and hide it, uh, this may be a thing you may want to do. Now, if you're hell bent on doing something goofy, or let's say you're going to be traveling overseas into hostile territory and you don't want uh, you know evil government whatever to be stealing your laptop and getting all your zero day, then maybe you want to uh, Canada. Yeah, Canada, you know, because they're, they're out to get us, okay? We know. we got NMRC members that are Canadian, and they're, they're you know, it's fierce and ugly. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, you, you want to make sure this stuff is safe. Hiding stuff in there might be a good idea. And at the same time, if you've got this rootkit in there that le legitimately you install it, you know, today, and then let's say in two years or so you're going to CanSec West and the... Uh, and the Mounties grab you, okay, and they do the forensics on your laptop, maybe things have caught up and now this type of, uh, you know, these executive objects root kits are now detectable, okay? So now it's detected, now it's there, and, and there you have it. Particularly, and we'll get into this a little bit more, particularly if your core skill set is in, uh, you know, Linux, but you're taking the Windows laptop because you're doing a presentation at a conference, for example. Not that Not we're saying laptop. that there's anything on this laptop and we, we didn't do anything bad. I'm and I don't know that. anything about Windows. Yeah, we don't know anything about Windows at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, legitimizing tools. We kind of touched on this already. Uh, and I think we've actually probably don't even need to stop on this slide. But um, absolutely legitimize your tools. Your tools that you have in your possession have to have legitimate function. Do not... Do not, do not. That's all I can say. About and this, again, yeah. this applies whether you've done anything bad or not. Which you di didn't and won't. Correct? Oh, yeah, we, uh, <laughs> there's really no reason for this slide in the presentation. And I did miss, mess with the uh, gamma to bring the dark areas up a little bit, but it was not pleasant. Uh, Bruce, are you in here? Is Bruce here? No? Well, Good. We got, we got more slides. We'll show you later. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, distribution. Um, this gets a little touchy. You know, how do you, how do you get, get the, the functionality and the methodologies and all those fun things out to people who want to use them without, you know, creating a web log that says they're looking for it? Um, we don't quite know yet. Uh, we do know where we're going to store them. Uh, in the meantime, get them anonymously in any way you can. I noticed there were some kiosks. Um, over <laughs> down the way a bit if you can, you know, if you happen to have a spare credit card that may not be yours feel free to uh, <laughs> you know, use it but I didn't tell you to do it um, oh absolutely not yeah you, I'm sorry oh yeah, the kiosk has a camera over it. I mean <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah, there's no cameras in the casino as, as right, well right, at right. all so it's, <laughs> No one will spot that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, yeah. If you're going to be if you're going to be doing this, consider using some privacy measures. I mean, even if you're, you know, seriously, even if you're just like you're curious about what this is and you think, well, I'm never even going to need this type of material. We don't have up much up there right now. Uh, uh, we've got the presentation, including uh, Bruce's crotch, uh, up there. Uh, but we will be adding a lot more uh, over uh, specifically over the next uh, few days uh, once we get past all the partying and whatnot. Uh, use use Tor. Tor is a, a wonderful uh, uh, a wonderful tool that I uh, encourage everyone to use. This is a, a, a good example of uh, a use for it. I'm going to be looking at something that someone else might be considered uh, questionable, and you know what? It's it's my goddamn business. If I look at it, I'm not you know, caring what anyone else says. No one needs to know about it. You go ahead and you know, use something like that. Right. And if anyone can come up with some alternate methods, uh, how we might get some of this stuff out, uh, uh, we don't have to talk about it here in, in this room, but uh, contact us afterward and we come up with some other creative ways to, as, as this grows, that we can get uh, more and more information out to people. Right. And I guess feasibly, um, one distribution method would be to on some of the uh, other toolkits, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe Backtrack's a good place to put something like this, it does, as long as it doesn't sway the opinion, the mass opinion that backtrack would be used to hide evidence or change evidence, cover evidence, whatever. 
uh, you know, maybe maybe that's where a distribution like this belongs. Uh, but if anybody's got anything, please get in touch with us, and we'll we'll uh, try and see if we can push that along. Um, Go for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. De definitely. Uh, PDTK definitely has some misuse, primarily from entities that may want to set you up. Um, I don't know how to fix that, uh, but it's it definitely can be used in an evil manner. Uh, specifically, if someone's wanting to, uh, you know, in like in a political case where uh, you're in the log somewhere, uh, someone may. I'm not saying that you know the feds that are here or corrupted in any way whatsoever or motivated to do anything other than bring us 100% justice. But if someone was on tight budget and needed to finish a case and you had made enemies at conferences by bad mouthing them and making statements like I just said uh, <laughs> to them, uh, you know, you might want to watch watch your back and, and make sure uh, stuff's not going on. So, you know, do your old school dual diligence stuff and, and just kind of watch for things happening like that. Uh, you know, if you, even if you've got to modify your, your tools to uh, look at deleted files nightly and see if anything that was created was actually ever existed on the system and stuff like that. Uh, presenting yourself as a dumbass uh, when there's plenty of evidence that proves otherwise is a bad thing. Once again, this is don't use the hacker defense. Um, we've, we'll go a little bit more into how that hasn't worked very well in a couple of case studies, but it, it just it doesn't work. Um, it, you have to be pretty much uh, 90 year, years old living in a shack out in the forest who manages to have a computer with Wi-Fi. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> to, to believe it, you know, for someone to believe it, it's just it's, it's not a good thing. So, so don't ever, you know, as we mentioned, don't, don't try to set up a system that you, that's, that's your caveat operating system or your caveat hardware set. Uh, use, use stuff that uh, you're well known for not knowing. Yeah, it's kind of hard, too, because a lot of people don't know they're dumbasses. And so it's just kind of a, almost an ambiguous thing. It's just, a, you know, don't present yourself as a dumbass when, in fact, many of you may be, we may be presenting ourselves as complete dumbasses. I mean, actually, considering we're talking about this whole methodology, at this point, none of this applies to us anymore. We've kind of, you know, dumbassed ourselves out of ever using any of this stuff in these slides <laughs> by giving a public presentation on it. Right. And you know, we've discussed it. It's like, well, you know, but so we're giving it to you. We're going to take the bullet on this one, and uh, we're just going to make sure. I'll go in the dunk tank for EFF, and you know, and hopefully, you know, that kind of thing. will you know, we won't have to deal with that kind of thing. That's at 4:30 outside. <laughs> and, and by the way, just so you know, I mean, we'd prefer that you just don't do something stupid, okay? Uh, simply because uh, there's a lot of bright people in here that are doing a lot of you know extremely fun and clever things. But if it reaches the point where you realize you're under an investigation of some type, uh, it's, it's too late to start thinking about, oh, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, doing that, you know, that inode manipulation thing, okay? It becomes obvious during, like say, during a forensics investigation where you've created these inodes uh, on there, or you've created files on your system that makes it look like it's got some type of cool rootkit on there. Uh, and then the forensics investigator, and they are, trust me, they're, I mean, a lot of them are extremely bright, uh, will go through there and they'll take a look at the listing of inodes and look at the date and time stamps. And you may have some date and time stamps on those inodes you just created uh, from six months ago that give you a perfect alibi. However, the inode number itself is not even close to the range where it should be, for example. This can happen. Uh, where it's even close to where it should be for other files created during that same time frame. You see what I'm saying? So you can't necessarily, uh, you know, always rely on that. And I mean, yeah, you can do some really low level type things maybe and get around some of that. Or you can decide I'm going to throw an encrypted file on there of, you know, whatever size every you know, every so often and then delete it and I've got an, an inode there I can use and, and I can shove something there. I mean, you can try, you can get really, but see, that's a lot of work and I know a lot of people don't necessarily want to do that. But I mean, this is something you have to actually kind of keep in mind as you're, as we're going through this. Yeah, laziness is your enemy. And yeah. I think we covered, uh, we covered that first one. Oh yeah, this, the, the second one though. I mean, if you're, 
if you're going through and you're trying to prove that you're, you know, that you're, that you're innocent because someone else popped you, I mean, you know, don't have, and you can't say, well, oh, yeah, well, I, and I, I, this has happened. I mean, I've actually been, I've actually been owned with my own exploits before. I mean, it's a, it's a horribly embarrassing, you know, as a, you know, as a, you know, giving a presentation, you know, you know, saying, here's this, you know, badass way to break in, then you find out later you got owned by that same, uh, same supposed badass way. But typically, if there's some like really cool zero day uh, that you've got, uh, you don't have the source code to that zero day and say, well, you know, that's probably how that other guy that did it got in, and you've got the source code for the damn exploit, and you know, right there in your in your uh, home directory. Or the web log showing that you downloaded the source code or anything like that. So. Yeah, I mean, it just you know, it 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 looks, you know, that's that's not something you wanna you you wanna have happen there. All right, now this is going to be, uh, we wanted to actually, now we, we, we debated on whether we're doing uh, demos or not, and we thought this actually was going to be a little bit more interesting. We're going to talk about uh, uh, four different uh, cases. Now our backgrounds, I mean, uh, Weasel's uh, done a lot of forensics work, and he's actually worked and helped take cases uh, you know, uh, for, he's, he's basically taken stuff and, and it's where it's gone to trial and put a, uh, a bad guy away or whatever. Uh, uh, I think mainly it's child porn. Some is. Child pornography cases. Yeah. And so we're going to take some examples from that. And both of us have done some pro bono work where we've actually helped out some uh, uh, defense expert witnesses to help them fill in the gaps when they hit something that they didn't understand. And so we want to talk about some real cases. Uh, there's at least uh, a couple of them that uh, hopefully are fairly well known that you've actually heard of that might be kind of interesting, uh, where we know some of the principal players and we can give you a little bit more background on what happened. All of these have a forensics element that's somewhat interesting that I think will, uh, this is probably, the, in my opinion, the, the best part of the, uh, of the presentation because everything we just talked about kind of is going to start to apply. No, this, this one is. Uh, oh yeah, this yeah, this one is this one's mine. Uh, in this one, we had a. Uh, uh, it was a, a the, the defendant. Uh, it was a child porn case, and the uh, the defendant is wanting to go to trial because he's uh, basically saying, "Cause I'm innocent. You know, there's uh, there's I'm not taking a plea bargain. I'm not doing any of this stuff. I didn't do it." Okay, and. Without going into like the other things, like I don't, th there was not any other physical evidence. There wasn't like magazines or you know printed out pictures or anything like that. It basically was files in a laptop. Uh, during the uh, forensics, the original prosecution forensics uh, investigation, they collected a lot of data. But again, this is one of these things where the forensics investigator, he's got 40 other uh, things to get through, he misses. Uh, that there is a, a remote access Trojan uh, on this Windows system. And, and again, also, the guy that, uh, that's happened to, not real computer savvy, okay? So the defense goes to the prosecution, because they've got like file listings uh, to start with, and they say, we want copies of these particular files, the binaries of these particular files. Uh, they put in the request, uh, and specifically they're wanting the binaries of these uh, of these Trojans. Uh, shortly after that, the uh, prosecution, and this is right before they are going to trial, uh, uh, the prosecution basically figures out where the defense is probably going to go with this, and they go ahead and drop the case. Okay. Now this is this is just to give you kind of a well. Here, let's we'll move on to the next one there. Uh, again, you know, defendant was not savvy. All right. So basically, if you're doing, if you're, if you've done something bad, okay, and you're in this room, this isn't going to work. All right, it's, it, you know, this is, you know, if you're savvy about this kind of stuff, you can't just leave, you know, an old version of Sub Seven sitting there on your, on your computer because odds are you probably might have checked for it. Yeah, I mean that, that second bullet's kind of funny, but um, I don't know. I, maybe in my jaded way, I, I heavily believe this. Uh, I, behind every prosecutor, or I guess in front of every prosecutor, is a district attorney with political agenda, and uh, their stats actually come into play in their career. So um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong on that, but I just really feel that uh, cases get dropped pretty easily if they, don't, if they look like it's going to be a chore or they're not going to at least get a plea bargain out of it. Just to give you an idea, uh, in, the, uh, 
in the in the federal court in the New York area, they have a 97 to 98 percent conviction rate. Okay, so essentially, you know, if you get busted, you you know you're it's, something's gonna it's gonna be bad. You're you're almost essentially guilty. All right, which is why we wanted to bring you know bring this kind of stuff up. Yeah, and and, and running trials costs money, and you know if you think if you're thinking of a prosecution. Uh, system that that's that's managed like a business. They're not going to invest money in areas where they're going to lose. So, yeah. And again, the the other interesting thing about this though was that uh, the forensics examiner missed this remote access Trojan, uh, and he should have caught it. This would be something that, and and a lot of times they that's one of the things they ask them uh, when they get on the stand. It's like, did you find any evidence of viruses? Uh, you know, is there any type of you know. Uh, uh, back door that had been put there by someone. They asked those types of questions, and this guy had missed that. And that probably right there, because he missed it, was probably why they're going to say, how can you trust the rest of the forensics data? He missed something this obvious, blah, blah, blah. And that's probably the old tail light the out on the cop car defense. Is this one yours? No, that's the okay, one that's this, this one. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is a case that I helped out with the uh, defense expert uh, by looking at the evidence and so forth. Basically, what the case was was that uh, someone was accused of child pornography, uh, trading him an IRC. More specifically, he was using the old IRC F servers, the DCC stuff, uh, to, to trade uh, and host uh, almost, uh, anonymous trading of an, anonymous from an access level where uh, people could access his, uh, his F server and, and download and upload uh, pornography. So he was found fairly easily uh, because he uh, was allowing anonymous access. He wasn't controlling access to the data that he was sharing. And uh, it came up. I, I want to think that he was actually found with maybe some bots somebody was running in IRC that was going out and doing analogy on the, uh, you know, on the uh, file names and so forth and actually found him that way. Uh, he claimed seeing uh, black screens and random text appearing. Those of you who know uh, Sub7 uh, pretty well has a little matrix screensaver where it, you know you can put black, black out the screen and put text across the top. Really old old stuff. It's just for screwing with people. But uh, he, he basically tried to say, hey, you know, I'm being I've, I've, I've got something going on. And he was smart enough to not say, I've got Sub7 on my system. He said, I've got uh, someone's, you know, something strange happened on my computer. I don't know what it is, but come to find out the guy was extremely technically savvy, understood. Uh, it was proven that he understood things quite well. He understood uh, all the components of uh, the compromise on his system and come to find out he had actually uh, planted the sub seven on his system. So basically here's someone that tried to pioneer the, you know, digital plausible deniability and failed. And uh, he ended up, uh, I believe, taking an extremely long sentence because of it. Um, Actually, we, we were talking about this this morning. He actually, um, he got 10 years yeah. uh, 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 for this, which in this case is good. Um, oh, is right? okay. So basically, we've, we've kind of, uh, the, the, the main things about this is that, again, the, the claims of stupidity, you know, you know, oh, I got hacked, you know, that's not going to work, okay? That is, it, the hacker defense is not a good defense, and it is rarely going to work at all. The uh, uh, the prosecutors, if you are going to come up with the hacker defense, the prosecutors are probably going to get even more pissed off and be even more venomous because it just irritates the fuck out of them. Okay. Right, and I believe in this t case specifically, the uh, judge that, uh, that, that oversaw the trial uh, saw the hacker defense coming and threw that whole bit out, said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow it. I, I, I don't, you know, so. Yeah, and I, I want to make one other comment because you've mentioned child porn in these first two examples, and, and you're probably thinking, oh, we got these two evil, long-haired hippies that are helping out child pornographers in their, uh, uh, de in their, in their defenses. I mean, there is such a thing as, I mean, everyone is, you know, is, deserves a, uh, a fair trial. But the other thing to keep in mind is that in a lot of times, um, uh, the, uh, the defense expert witness comes back to the lawyer of the defendant and says, you know what? I found all this stuff. He is absolutely 100% guilty. In fact, I found more than what the prosecutor found. Uh, this needs to be, you know, there's no reason to even go to trial. You need to plead this one. Yeah, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll plead it out pretty quick. Because, simply because, I mean, the attorney is going to want to know mm -hmm. if, if their client is telling the truth. They don't often know. And sometimes this is basically how this ends up playing out, is that you've got the defense expert witnesses actually saying, yes, by God, he is guilty. And 
Uh, I can think of in a couple of uh, several instances uh, where a defense expert witness says, N I recommend you do not put me on the stand because all I'm going to do is just make things even worse. And this is not just child porn, but in just uh, regular hacking cases as well, where it says, don't put me on the stand. I think the guy's guilty, and that's what I'll say. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, he went off with his, you know, five grand, ten grand fee for being a defense expert witness, yeah. and, and yeah, there he went. <laughs> This one you know more yeah. about than I do. Yeah, this one, uh, uh, we have a state senator uh, that's under investigation in, in, uh, for fraud in Pennsylvania. This one is fascinating, okay? Absolutely fascinating. Two system admins, okay? They're basically being told uh, uh, from higher up, you know, the senator, they're being told, get rid of all the evidence of our fraud. You know, the guy's doing some kind of goofy, you know, money laundering thing through a nonprofit. It's, it's, it's kind of ugly. If you Google on, the, uh, on these people, you'll, uh, on their names, I'll give you some information. I've got, the, we've actually got a link to the indictment in here too. Uh, it says delete every piece of email that you can. Now what happened is these guys are running around with uh, PGP wipe, they're running around doing all this other kind of goofy stuff, trying to delete every piece of email they can. And some of the things they forgot to delete was their chatter back and forth in email, like, hey, did you delete Connie's PC with the uh, stuff? And they forgot to delete that kind of stuff. So, but I mean, it's, it's 65, 70 pages of, of uh, stuff in there. It is fascinating. And I recommend everyone in this room read that thing because you get to really, really see what it, you can see, you can get into the mindset of what they were going through. and by implication you see the mindset of of why these two guys from the prosecution standpoint why these two guys got indicted yeah, and it shows where these guys were so focused on uh covering the tracks for the senator they did, didn't think about themselves and that's how you know they got popped for it and what was really even was was sad is that uh and i haven't been following it here just lately but uh, uh these guys were indicted before the senator was so the All senator right. will be indicted. <laughs> <laughs> Do what? This took place uh, this past May. Yeah, yeah, it's still playing out. It's still yeah, so it's not done. Anyway, basically, here's a couple of interesting things that you'll gather from reading the indictment. Number one, you run PGP wipe. There is a fingerprint that it actually leaves on the system. It uses a, a uh, it's like there's a, some type of there's some temp files and stuff that it uses when it's writing and it does erase those, but it didn't do a secure erase of its temp file, okay? So what happens is you can tell with a date and a timestamp when PGP wipe was run. Something to keep in mind, if you're gonna be doing PGP wipe on a regular basis for years and years, that's one thing. But if uh, all of a sudden your boss has been in, you know, is under investigation for something, and starting the next Monday, you're running PGP wipe on everything. It's going to look like you're possibly involved in some type of cover-up. Yeah, I got a, no. it got a question. Does the cipher leave any traces behind? As the, the cipher leaves any any traces, I don't. I, my understanding is that it does, uh, but I don't know that for sure. Yeah. Okay. XP utility, right? Pardon? Yeah, yeah. The, in a lot of cases, yes, there's certain things they could, they may not be able to identify the specific tool, but they can tell something's been done. You know, where, where like it depends on the way the wipe's done. If the wipe is like, uh, you know, where they do um, uh, random data uh, in there, or they wipe with, let's say they do a pass with all uh, all zeros and then all Fs or something like that. I mean, then it, then it's. Uh, you can see that. I mean, it'll look pretty obvious that something's been done because in all your in, you know, in all your free space, you know, especially if it's if it's a tool that goes in and does Slack, uh, file Slack, uh, then it'll see all those spaces in there uh, where things have been putting in there. And it's conceivably, if it's random data, I mean, a lot of, I mean, I don't know if they want to do this. Maybe some defense expert people might want to keep this in mind. In theory, you could run some type of analysis on the on the data to say, is this random? Is, does this look like there's a pattern to it? Is it more random than this other's part? You know, that kind of thing. But that's, but, but again, that's, see, that's the thing that gets really interesting from our perspective. But remember that the jury is like your grandmother and, and whatnot. And so they're not even, they're just gonna hear a bad guy did something 
and a guy in a suit is telling me that uh, he has positive proof that I don't understand that he did it. Yeah, and I wasn't smart enough to get out of jury duty, so. <laughs> Which we're going to touch on in a minute. Right, we right. don't think that's, uh, we, we think actually, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but the thing is, is, you know, these ad, the, the admins, just so you know, in this particular case, and you know how, like, you know, the DOJ really likes to make the numbers look big because when it comes to budget time, it looks good when they're saying these big numbers. Uh, but, like, for, uh, uh, for these two guys, one of them's, like, 50 years old. The other one's, like, 36 years old. Uh, one of them, uh, and this is in the, the, the goddamn press release, it says, you know, uh, he's, uh, uh, could spend... Uh, 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 495 years in jail and 7.5 million dollars in fines, and, and the other guy is like, you know, he's getting apparently a pretty easy deal. He's only got you know 25 years. Okay, and why did I take that Compte exam? Yeah, I. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now granted, it's not. They're not going to give a guy you know 500 years for, uh, you know wiping emails but I mean you get the idea I mean it's looking grim and they really stack it up to where it looks really uh, yeah they, really they, ugly they, they want to scare the shit out of those two for obvious reasons yeah well yeah they're gonna go back and and basically roll over on the senators what they're gonna do um, anyone recognize uh, this one the uh, Zezoff or, or uh, whatever it is this is the guy this is the Michael uh, Bloomberg case and this is where this uh, came down, I guess, just uh, fairly recently, last last year or two. Anyway, this particular individual, and this is before Michael Bloomberg became uh, uh, mayor of New York. He ran this big firm. They have this, uh, you know, financial software. This guy over in um, Russia. Uh, no, he wasn't from Russia, but he was Russian. But he's in like a, he's one of the uh, he's, he was in a stan or a vakia. Okay, one of the stands or one of the vakias. Uh, and I don't remember off the top of my head, okay, give me a break. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I mean, what this guy did was he found a flaw and then he was, uh, and it's, it's kind of interesting technically where there's like normally with the software there'd be a login, but then there's like some secondary stuff that goes in under the covers to uh, make sure that the rest of the transaction is going to work. And this guy used like, you know, soft dice and could bypass the first part, which is using the second part. And so he gets into the point where he's in like, uh, uh, their uh, their Solaris you know back end system and so now he's sending emails from Bloomberg to Bloomberg saying I found holes in your stuff and Bloomberg forwards it off to you know the uh, guy saying uh, hey I got this weird message can you look into this and the guy r r says no I told he sends another message saying don't send it off to your tech person I'm telling you you got to hold me he's really kind of you know he's really fucking with the guy. All right, so the thing that's really interesting about this, this really hasn't been made public, is that because uh, he's like in you know, you know Kazakhstan or whatever it is that he's in, uh, they confiscate his computer overseas, and uh, at, this is you know after he gets arrested and everything, they confiscate his computer overseas and it's in the possession of a foreign government. Now, there were modifications. Now, the defense expert found that there were modifications made from the time, uh, th with a time stamp that was after the seizure by the foreign government, but before it was turned over to the US, who did the forensics investigation. So the guy has essentially plausible deniability. And the two main threatening emails. Uh, that came where it's like you're going to pay me a couple hundred thousand dollars and, and everything. These two emails are like worded slightly different. You know, words are misspelled uh, in these that are not misspelled in all the other emails and that kind of thing. So there's like these things that are created in there that makes that are really the bad stuff. Uh, this evidence is not thrown out, okay? They managed to say it's okay to let this stuff in. Now, of course, the bad thing is, of course, it's like, you know, pay me $200,000 and, you know, I'll meet with you and you give me the money and everything like that. What's weird about it is the guy that if it would have convicted him was the guy still showed up at the meeting with uh, Bloomberg to get his cash, which is when they, uh, when they, when they got him. So, I mean, it's kind of, you know, kind of, it's still kind of stupid. His actions is, are, are really what convicted him on it. 
but nonetheless, had he, you know, if, if it had just been the threat and they, and they grab him on that, there was evidence there and it was actually thrown out. Yeah, and, and I believe that there was speculation uh, by the defense off the record uh, was that maybe this was an agreement between the foreign government and our government to uh, show that they were working together really well. So maybe some evidence was still accepted even though it may have shouldn't have or anything. I don't know that there was enough there to actually uh, bring up an appeal of any sort. I don't know if there is an actual appeal in, appeal in the works on that case either. Yeah, but but nonetheless, I mean, you know, you have this, uh, uh, you know, there there were politics involved in this. Obviously, you got Bloomberg as a big. It was it was just a, a circus of a trial. Uh, uh, just you know, just g Google for the for the names in here, and, you, and you'll and you'll find plenty of stuff on it. Uh, also, the other thing to keep in mind: this guy was actually the, the uh, defendant was acting nuts in court and was like you know yelling and screaming in Russian at people and he wanted to wear his jumpsuit, which everybody's <laughs> knows you dress well and look like you're a good upright standing citizen. So, see, we, our motivation not to ever get busted is because we don't want to cut our hair. So, um, it's essentially so, it. So there you go. Uh, but yeah, he was cre he was acting erratic. Uh, he, the guy had been in jail for two years waiting for the trial, and uh, his family showed up, and the kid was in the court. His two year old, or I guess three or four year old son, was in court, and he went barreling through the court to jump over to hug his kid, and that was just looked really poorly f to the jury because they intercepted him before he got there, so it looked like he was trying to make a dodge for the door and all this stuff. So uh, yeah, his behavior was very damaging to him to the jury. Yes. <laughs> the uh, question was, uh, so are you saying that Mudge uh, got busted, that's why his hair's short? Uh, you'll, have to ask, you'll have to ask Mudge that question. Either that or he's now busting people. We haven't decided yeah. which, one, you know, which one it is. Mudge is a fed. Yeah. Oh, yeah, here's another uh, useless slide. This, we took this yesterday right before Bruce spoke uh, of uh, Bruce's crotch, and so we just thought we'd throw it into our presentation for no apparent reason. All right, so a few conclusions here. Again, as I mentioned, if you can control the bits and bytes in your computer, and read, read that indictment uh, for, uh, for sure, but uh, if you can control the bits and bytes of an investigation, you can kind of control the flow of it. But you have to act now if you want to control the flow of it. And quite frankly, I'd recommend you do it now, whether you think you're going to do anything bad in the future, whether you know you're not going to do anything bad in the future, because you really never know. I mean, the, the whole design of this is if you're living under uh, a repressive re regime, that you may want to do this because you're, you're starting to lose some trust in the government. And that is happening to a certain degree here. It could get better, it could get worse. I'm not giving an Annie Bush thing because I, I thought Clinton was a dick too. But I mean, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, hey, come on. I mean, you know, the, uh, there, there's some, you know, when you have, you know, Pardon? Yeah, clipper chip. Someone, yeah, exactly. Yeah, clipper chip. Uh, uh, let's see. Let's see. A DMCA. Whose watch was that on? I mean, come on. I mean, there were some bad things that have gone. And then, then we got, it was drafted at the same time. Yeah, you, uh, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. USA Patriot. I mean, all these things. I mean, you know, it. You know, it's it's kind of it's kind of scary times. So we may have to actually try to try to try to do some of these things. Now, again, I mean. We're just talking about mainly the forensics thing. We can't tell you how to walk and talk and act and behave, okay? But if you're going to walk the walk and talk the talk of a good model citizen because you don't want to get caught, then actually do it. You know, I guess don't give up, don't, you know, give talks on DEF CON about thwarting government investigations <laughs> might be a good start. But you, you see what I'm saying? You get, you get uh, kind of the idea. And even the best stuff, even the best stuff you do, if you're like, you know, bragging to your buddies about it that, hey, I popped this box, I mean, that's just, you know, that's, that's kind of stupid. Do it to learn, not to brag. Exactly. Uh, and the other, the last point on here, uh, and I encourage everyone to do this, instead of trying to get out of uh, jury duty, show up in a suit and tie and try to actually participate and actually see what goes on in a court because it is conceivable that if something does happen to you, I think it's a good idea for all of you to meet your jury of peers, okay? It can be an enlightening and very frightening experience. Again, it's, it's a large or a group of people who were not smart enough to get out of jury duty. 
Yeah, so go in there. I say go in there and learn something. Educate these people while you're in there as well. I mean, go in there and actually participate. Yes, we got uh, the EFF not heckling, which is pretty good. Uh, we can do a quick Q&A. <laughs> So this is what happens when Weasel's working on slides while watching CNN, okay? <laughs> so if anyone's got some questions, there's a mic up there. We got uh, time for just, uh, uh, just a few. Yes? The presence of encrypted files. Uh, uh, it, it, it could be considered evidence against you if you have uh, encrypted files on your system. You um, encrypt everything, not just the good stuff. Yeah. That's just... All right. Okay. You're, you're, you encrypt your porn. Encrypt your, uh, you know, encrypt uh, meaningless logs. RFCs. Encrypt, uh, whatever you want. You, just, <laughs> you are welcome to encrypt anything you want. And uh, it's been done where people have actually uh, pled the fifth instead of giving up their PGP... Uh, 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 passphrase. Now, I in case there is something in there, okay, that, that you really don't want them uh, uh, to be looking at. I mean, it's, it's worked. They, I mean, okay, okay, it was Mitnick, and we all know how shitty that turned out for him. But I mean, nonetheless, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can do that if you want, okay. And they didn't tack on extra time for not turning over his uh, his uh, passphrase. Uh, but uh, yeah, I can. Uh, uh, it. Yeah, you should be using, everyone should be using encryption anyway, okay? For the same reason if we see something, some technological piece of uh, doodad that we want to play with simply because we're hackers, that's what we do. You should encrypt for the exact same reason, because you can. Yeah, yeah question? Um, basically, I, I'm kind of curious, uh, you know, you're talking about putting stuff in beforehand, but I mean, if you're putting in a root kit to prove that, uh, give yourself some plausible deniability, don't you really need to also have that rootkit actually doing something like collecting your passwords and other things that actually makes it look like it's something other than just a random rootkit that didn't really do anything? Sure, not not one file. Yeah, you, you want to layer all of the stuff that you're doing. You want to create deleted files that were you know created by created and deleted by the root. Yeah, and so even yeah. even something like a rootkit that appeared to be active for three or four months. Well, and I, then is no longer active. I mean, yeah, show up in your ISP logs as a zombie for a little bit. I mean, there's and and then and then you do it, and then you do something else, and then you do something else, and you just layer these things on. I mean, that's what we're talking about. Is you know, yeah, you can't just, you can't just, yeah, you can't just leave a copy of it lying on there. Now, if you're clever, you may leave a copy of it lying, uh, something lying on there that when pulled out inside of a forensics investigation, it's like uh, a, what would be a natural remnant of someone who really hid stuff well, okay? Right. And there's this little piece that's left. You may even want something like that as well. Yeah. Now, a, a, as a part of doing something like this, I mean, it, that that almost that requires a lot of effort and follow up and chasing it down. And isn't it just simpler to, as you were just saying, encrypt everything, make sure that that's your habit, that's your practice, and then if it, I mean, if you get popped, just plead the fifth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. You know, yep. Use use the Fourth Amendment. Yeah, and uh, I just I brought this last slide. Um, Bruce Potter still isn't in here, is he? Okay, good. This is what I want everyone to do. All right. <laughs> take take pictures of his crotch. Okay. Send them to this email address. Yes, you it can certainly be don't too. have a question about his crotch, do you? Dude? <laughs> I, we we don't have anything against his crotch. It's just that we use a couple Except of these our cameras. Our yeah. cameras are against his crotch. Yeah, it, we, it just send us uh, pictures to this email, and uh, got an we we got an idea for some stuff that we'd like to do. Yeah. Okay, what? don't don't tell him why you're doing it. Just take a picture well, this of his is a crotch. Secret. Don't tell Bruce. No <laughs> yeah, one. Don't we tell Bruce you. that we did this. You're, you in, our, you're in our group, and okay. we're over here. <laughs> we're the cool people who take pictures of Bruce's crotch, and then there's the rest of you. But anyway, okay. All right. The next question. Yeah, earlier on you were talking about the lost key syndrome. Yes. Um, given your experience in forensics, what is there an approach to take uh, in evidence creation where they're more likely to find one particular thing uh, earlier on? I'll, t I'll touch on this. Um, right now, maybe not. 
but I think everybody can agree with me that universities will soon be turning out uh, in-case jockeys, and uh, investigations probably won't go beyond that tool. Uh, so if you understand the tools that are going to be used against you, uh, then you know exactly what you need to do. Um, yeah, that's, 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 that's pretty much it. I, yeah, the, the, the best one I, I can, the best example I can give is, you know, if you're a Linux guy, you know, you, you, you put all the bad stuff happening on your Windows box or vice versa, okay? The, the system you don't know as much about. It's a good learning experience. You get to learn a new, new operating system. It increases your skill set. And maybe you'll throw the bad stuff on yet another operating system that comes along later later on. Uh, but uh, basically, think about what what they would grab, and then and then and then go from there. Thank you. Earlier, you mentioned uh, uh, something about the fingerprint of well, PGP uh, white. Uh, have you uh, or are you aware? Have you done any, or are you aware of any research into uh, things like uh, what a uh, hard drive? Uh, looks like when it's fresh from the manufacturer, uh, perhaps writing tools that restore a, uh, a hard drive to look like it's never been written to? Um, I've done a little bit of stuff in that, in that arena, and that is that uh, uh, I've just like a lot of Googling and whatnot. Uh, Peter Gutman, who's actually uh, here at this conference, uh, did a paper a number of years ago that talked about you know, the drive. and and how you should do like you know 27 passes and, and, and whatnot. Technology has changed so much. Drive technology has improved so much since that paper. He's one of the first ones to say this doesn't apply anymore. And so to get it to a state to where it's back to the way it was, so to speak, is fairly easy to do, okay, with conventional wiping tools, okay? And you can use stuff like uh, I mean, because uh, PGP does have, uh, they've got other tools for assisting in this. There's other people that have tools for assisting in this where you can actually go through there and actually really, uh, you know, zero the thing out. You don't have to do the, uh, uh, oh, and by the way, just because I do know a little bit about this, I've spoken to both the people that developed the uh, NSA, the, the NSA person that developed the standard for wiping. Uh, it is not seven passes, it's three, okay? Uh, they say seven passes a lot of times because there was a product that was approved uh, for use in the government that happened to do seven passes. It did four extra. So it met the criteria. So everyone says, oh, I, I'm government you know, certified. I do seven passes. Three passes is enough. You do once with zeros. You do once with FFs. And then you do a random character that you uh, uh, verify that you've read and write uh, back from the drive to verify it's actually there. And that's considered good enough for pretty much uh, anything, and you're certainly, yeah, again, you're going to thwart the uh, end case jockeys or, or whatever with that stuff gone. Yeah, yeah. But, but are drives coming from the factory with randomness, or are they coming with all zero? Oh, that's, that's what I mean. Uh, no, they'll ha there'll, be some, there'll be some data on there because they do, they, a lot of them, they'll do some stress tests and stuff like that. Now, yeah, conceivably, you could fingerprint and say, okay, they use these types of tools to test the drives, so we're going to have these types of uh, uh, bytes on there. Conceivably, yeah, you could write a tool that actually did I haven't that. heard of a tool yet, so. Okay. That'd be a fun thing to do. All right, and, thanks. All right. I think we've been cut off, but oh, what's I, that? I want one more question. question. One more question from John. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I'm John Callis. I'm CTO at PGP. Uh, I was going to say that just about all wiping programs have some sort of passive fingerprint that you can tell what wiping program was done on it. The, and they are also not designed to make it look like your disk was not wiped. To do that, you would need to, after you do your three passes or whatever, then do an additional pass that layers over some data that looks like the, the disk was not wiped. If you want to regularly wipe your drive, you are much better off having some sort of cron job or something else that, that wipes it 3 a.m., 5 a.m. every Sunday and, and say, this is my policy, I wipe it every week, than you are to wipe it once. It is the wiping it once right after something bad happens that, that, that is a huge signal. Yeah, again, yes. that's, yeah, that's, that exactly. speaks that's to exactly what we've been saying, so thank you. All right, thanks, Sean. All right, uh, yeah, we've we cut off. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, everyone.